when we had a president, we'd see a giant global political figure. The man that would be the political leader for 500 million people. The man that would represent all of us on the world stage. The man whose job was so important that, of course, you're paid more than President Obama. Well, I'm afraid what we got was you. And I'm sorry, but after that performance earlier that you gave, and I don't want to be rude, but, but, you know, really, you have the charisma of a damp rag, of a damp rag, and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. And the question that I want to ask, the question that I want to ask, that we're all going to ask, is who are you? I'd never heard of you. Nobody in Europe had ever heard of you. I would like to ask you, President, who voted for you? And what mechanism? Oh, I know democracy is not popular with you lot. And uh, what mechanism do the peoples of Europe have Mr. to remove President. you? Is this European democracy? Well, I, I sense, uh, I sense well, though, that you're competent and capable and dangerous. And I EFDD fraction. The EFDD group, Mr. Farage. Good morning. Good morning. Just a second, Mr. Farage. Ladies and gentlemen, one major quality of democracy is that you listen to those even if you don't share their opinion. Well, thank you, Mr. Schultz. Isn't it funny? You know, when I came here 17 years ago and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? On behalf of the EFDD, I give the floor to Mr. Farage. Thank you. Imagine you invited a very important guest round for dinner and you made all the preparations and there were some very important confidential conversations that needed to be had and you thought everything had gone well and yet within hours your guest had told the outside world that you the host were deluded that you were living in a different galaxy and then all the contents of the conversation were blabbed to an opposition newspaper and to add insult to injury uh, you say the food wasn't actually very good either and then, a few days later, in a display of extreme petulance, you even deride the national language of the host, which, by the way, is looking a bit silly, because last Saturday's extravaganza, known as the Eurovision Song Contest, saw 90% of the songs sung in English. Well, good morning, Mr Van Rompuy. You've been in office for one year, and in that time, the whole edifice is beginning to crumble. Uh, there's chaos. Uh, the money's running out. I should thank you. You should perhaps be the pin-up boy of the Eurosceptic movement. But just look around this chamber this morning. Just look at these faces. Look at the fear. Look at the anger. Poor old Barroso here looks like he's seen a ghost. You know, they're beginning to understand that the game is up. And yet, in their desperation to preserve their dream, they want to remove any remaining traces of democracy from the system. And it's pretty clear that none of you have learned anything. You know, when you yourself, Mr. Van Rompuy, say that the euro has brought us stability, I suppose I could applaud you for having a sense of humour, but isn't this really just the bunker mentality? You know, your fanaticism is out in the open. You talked about the fact that it was a lie to believe that the nation state could exist in a 21st century globalised world. Well, that may be true in the case of Belgium, who haven't had a government for six months, but for the rest of us, right across every member state in this union, and perhaps this is why we see the fear in the faces, increasingly people are saying, we don't want that flag, we don't want the anthem, we don't want this political class, we want the whole thing consigned to the dustbin of history. Because I think we're expecting Nigel Farage. David. Thank you very much. So I think we're joined by Nigel Farage. I hope we are. Ah, uh, he's speaking Ladies and gentlemen, supporters. let's hear him. Dare to dream that the dawn is breaking on an independent United Kingdom. This, 
This, if, all, if the predictions now are right, this will be a victory for real people, a victory for ordinary people, a victory for decent people. We have fought, we have fought against the multinationals, we fought against the big merchant banks, we fought against big politics, we fought against lies, corruption and deceit, and today, honesty, decency and belief in nation, I think now is going to win. Morning. The sun has risen on an independent United Kingdom. And just look at it, even the weather's improved. It's been a hell of a long journey, this. I first got involved in Eurosceptic politics 25 years ago, and the first election I contested, uh, I managed to beat the late, great, screaming Lord Such by 164 votes, so I didn't come last. And now there are 17 million people that voted for Brexit. It's a victory for ordinary people, decent people. It's a victory against the big merchant banks, against the big businesses and against big politics. And I'm proud of everybody that had the courage in the face of all the threats, everything they were told, they had the guts to stand up and do the right thing. Theresa May has told the BBC that there should be a look at further reforms in the free movement of people if Britain votes to stay in the EU. Speaking exclusively to our political editor Laura Koonsberg, Ms May explained how she decided to back the Remain campaign. This is the latest in Laura's interviews with key figures from both sides of the campaign. In a world of loudmouths, she's a quiet politician. Don't mistake that for having nothing to say. <laughs> for a while on the EU, though, it wasn't clear where Theresa May would pin her colours, which way she'd go. This way. Well, there were plenty of voices uh, suggesting where, what I should do in this. Of course, there were quite a lot of voices suggesting that I should go down the Leave route. But as I say, I, I approach this decision in the way I approach other important decisions. Look at the facts uh, and uh, come to a view. And when I put all that together, when I think about the potential risk to jobs, the uncertainties for our economy if we were to leave the European Union, when I think about the security, the discussions I've had within the EU, because I do believe we are more secure in the EU. I wonder, I'm going to go to Martin in Ealing. Good evening, Martin. How are you going to vote on the 8th um, of June? Hello, Nigel. To be honest with you, I am a UKIP voter and I am going to be voting Conservative at this general election. I honestly and truthfully do not think that UKIP voters should, at this particular stage of Brexit, pay party politics with the future of our country. Well, you could argue, Martin, that one of the reasons that, uh, we, have, that we had the referendum is that the impact of those four million votes is that we hurt the Labour Party very much more than we hurt the Conservative Party. I mean, seats like, seats like Warwickshire North, that the Labour Party had sort of number two on their hit list, and UKIP get eight, 9,000 votes, and the Tories win it comfortably. So, so maybe, Martin, the effect these days of a UKIP vote um, is that it actually helps the Conservative Party, uh, particularly in the Midlands and the North and areas like that. I would also say, Martin, um, that... Over the course of the last few weeks on this show, I have talked about some nervousness. I've talked about the fact that when it comes to getting back our fishing waters, the government won't commit to it. I've talked about the fact that uh, she's happy, Mrs May, to keep as part of the European arrest warrant, which means the European Court of Justice ultimately still has some say over this country. I've, I've said I'm very worried um, about what's going to happen with immigration uh, when we hear talk of transitional arrangements. Is it possible, Martin, that Theresa May fights this election from an unassailable position, wins a big majority saying Brexit means Brexit, and then actually, because she hasn't got the 2019 deadline followed immediately by a general election, then starts to make a whole series of concessions, meaning that Brexit voters don't get what they want. And in those circumstances, isn't the UKIP voice and the UKIP argument that rather than going through years of negotiations, we should just get on with this. Isn't that an important voice? Martin, I mean, you know, <laughs> OK, but the Lib Dems and Labour absolutely hate each other. They can't stand the sight of each other. And the fact that it's a snap election 
And the fact there's only a few weeks to get nominations in, I would have thought Martin makes a deal of that kind extremely unlikely. No, nothing's impossible, but unlikely. Uh, but Martin, I do repeat the point, and thank you for what you had to say, but I do repeat the point that the UKIP voice is very, very important, and a big majority for Theresa May, without that 2020 deadline, could mean all sorts of transitional arrangements and a very, very soft Brexit. But, I mean, those of you out there that disagree with that, please do come on, let me know. Everyone's going to have their say.